Now, Polycarp is an interesting person. He lived with, there's some dispute of the exact years, but 69 to 156 AD. He lived to be 86. And he was a disciple of the Apostle John. John of the Bible, who wrote the book of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Yeah, that John. John was the youngest of the disciples, and he was not martyred like the others were. They tried to kill him in a vat of oil, and the legend says he wasn't even harmed. God supernaturally preserved him for a purpose. God had, a higher, had another purpose for him. Not a higher purpose, sorry, I take that back. He had another purpose for him. And uh, ended up writing the book of Revelation, which we're going to study starting in two weeks. And so Polycarp, if he was born in 69, that means that John died probably somewhere around 95-ish. We don't know exact. So there's an overlap there of um, close to 30 years, 25 years. So imagine Polycarp being 20s, maybe a teenager, meeting John when John was old and being a disciple of John and hearing firsthand accounts of stories about Jesus. Can you imagine young Polycarp sitting there under the feet of this old man and John saying, yeah, I remember what it was like to lean my head against his shoulder and I heard his heartbeat and the words he spoke to me and the love that I could see in his eyes. Do you think that influenced impacted Polycarp's life? You bet it did. Polycarp carried that all through his life. And when he was old himself, he was a rock star. And he was appointed the bishop of the church in Smyrna. Does the name Smyrna ring a bell? Book of Revelation, one of the seven churches that received a letter. In fact, it was the second letter that Jesus wrote to the seven churches. And that excerpt I read to you at the beginning... That was from the letter to the church in Smyrna. Be faithful unto death. You think Polycarp read that? <laughs> sure he did. He was the pastor of the church at the time. He knew what they were going to go through. But it was written to all of us. Okay. Well, Smyrna, by the way, is interesting. First of all, the word, the word comes from the root word of mir, as in gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it was a fragrance. It was a, but the only way to get the aroma out of it is when you squashed it, when you apply pressure. Think about the analogy there with persecution. It released a beautiful fragrance when it was crushed. Later, Smyrna in, in modern times, uh, excuse me, um, Smyrna is in modern day Turkey, and it is now the modern day city of Izmir. You've heard of Izmir, the third largest city in Turkey. That is ancient Smyrna. And some of the stuff that existed, including the arena that we're going to hear about in a few minutes, is still there. Interesting. I'd love to go there. All right, well, that's, that's enough background. I want to tell you now the story of Polycarp himself. And it's quite fascinating. It's a wonderful story. See, Polycarp was faithful, preaching the gospel like you saw illustrated in that movie clip. And the Roman leadership didn't like it. Seized the Caesar, who at the time was, I believe, Nero. This was the, uh, Nero was the Roman, um, the Roman leader at the time. He was not a nice guy, Nero. He was quite evil. He hated the Christians. They, the, 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 Roman gods, they had many gods, they felt like when people worshipped the Roman gods, which included the Caesar, whoever Caesar was, worshipped him as a god, that God would, the gods would be faithful to the people and make everything good, make crops plentiful and make good rain and bring blessing to the cities, right? And so when things went bad, guess who was the scapegoat? The Christians, because they refused to worship Caesar, they had this Jesus God, and they only worshipped him. They, weren't, they didn't have a problem with them worshipping Jesus Christ, but they wanted them to worship all the others as well. And that's what the Christians stubbornly refused to do. They were the problem people. 
And so pressure is mounting, okay? And finally, it comes to a, it comes to a breaking point, and they come after Polycarp. We've had enough, Polycarp. We're going to arrest you. And word got to Polycarp. He could have escaped. He sat in his study and said, God's will be done. And when the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, came to his house to arrest him, he invited them to sit down for food. And he served them. And then um, they were amazed by this man. And um, there's a lot of eyewitness testimonies, by the way. A lot of things that were written down and passed on. So I'm going to tell you a lot of details about things he said and that were done that are eyewitness testimony by multiple people. So we have a lot of credibility. And some of the specific words that he spoke. And some of these soldiers said, they said to each other, why did we go to all this trouble to capture a man like this? You know, they're starting to like the guy already. Then he, so, so, so um, Polycarp calls for food and drink. And then he asked them if he could, have an hour to pray and are uninterrupted before they took him away. And out of respect, they said, sure, sure, go have your hour of prayer. So he stood right there on the spot and prayed for two hours, uninterrupted. He was so full of the grace of God, it, they said, that he could not stop for two hours. And the men, the Romans, were astounded. And many of them regretted coming to arrest such a godly old man. But they had to do their job. So as Polycarp was being taken into the arena, I, I, I didn't verify, but I'm guessing the same arena that exists today in Izmir, Turkey. Many, every, every, uh, almost every account of the life of Polycarp I read, I read a lot of different sources this past week, all said the same thing. That as he was coming into the arena, a voice was heard from the sky. No one could see the source of the voice, but this voice spoke, and all the people close heard it. Not all the people heard it, but the people close heard it. And the voice said, Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. No one saw it, but many heard it. Now the proconsul, this Roman leader in charge of this assembly, this court, whatever you want to call it, he urged, he said to Polycarp, Swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent, and say, down with the atheists, and you'll be released. Now, when the Roman proconsul said, down with the atheists, he met, he met the Christians who refused to believe in the Roman gods and worship Caesar. They were called atheists in their mind because they refused to worship these Roman gods. <laughs> so, Polycarp, he looks at the crowd. It says that he pointed his finger and he looked grimly at the wicked heathen multitude in the stadium and gesturing toward them. He said, down with the atheists. <laughs> he was mocking the proconsul. The proconsul did not uh, find it amusing. <laughs> and he said, he continued, he said, swear, reproach Christ and I will set you free. So Polycarp looked at him and said, 86 years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How, come I, how can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Proconsul said, I have wild animals here, and I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Call them, Polycarp said. <laughs> Don't you love this guy? <laughs> Well, if you, if you despise the animals, I will have you burned. Polycarp calmly replied, You threaten me with fire that burns for an hour and then is extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. The crowd, the excited crowd. They collected wood and bundles of sticks from all around the area and they brought it in quickly. Jews and pagan Gentiles, all the Jews hated them. Some of them did. And when the pile was ready, Polycarp took off his outer clothes, undid his belt, 
and tried to take off his sandals. But he was not used to bending down to take off his sandals because he had so many people that loved him so much that any time he had ever started to take off his sandals, people raced over to him to take off his sandals for him because they just wanted to touch his skin. That's how loved Polycarp was by the other believers. Apparently it was a custom when people were burned at the stake to nail their feet to the stake so they couldn't run. And they started to nail him down. And uh, Polycarp said, Leave me as I am, for he that gives me strength to endure the fire will enable me. He will enable me not to struggle without the help of your nails. So they complied. They didn't nail him, but they bound him with his hands behind him like a distinguished ram chosen from a great flock for sacrifice. Now here's the part I like. Polycarp looked up to heaven and he said, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the knowledge of you, the God of angels, powers, and every creature, and all the righteous who live before you, I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among your martyrs, sharing the cup of Christ, and the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body, through the immortality of the Holy Spirit, may I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice, as you, the true God, have predestined, revealed to me, and now fulfilled. I praise you for all these things. I bless you and glorify you, along with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, to you with him, through the Holy Ghost, be glory both now and forever. Amen. Think anyone listening in got saved and born again right there on the spot? The fire was lit. The flame blazed furiously. Now, this is what all the eyewitnesses, and there were many, both of his followers the Christ followers, the people of the church, and others who didn't believe in the same Christ that Polycarp did. And the story is told at this point that something amazing happened, that the fire went up quickly, but then something happened. It was like the sail of a ship with wind in it, and it bowed outward and around, and it made sort of like a, a, it surrounded him. And it was no fire in the center. It was like wind was keeping the fire away from him. And it made a big arch over him like a, like a sail. And the testimony is that um, it, he didn't burn like people normally would burn in a fire. That it was more like he was baked like bread and started to glow gold or silver like in a furnace. And, and the testimony also is that instead of the smell of burnt flesh, people smelled a sweet scent like frankincense or some other precious spice. Eventually, when those wicked men saw that his body could not be consumed by the fire, they commanded an executioner to pierce him with a dagger. And when he did this, such a great quantity of blood flowed that the fire was extinguished. Um, there's one, one account of the story that I read that said that they were so angry they took his body then outside the city and burned it again and then buried the bones. <laughs> so let me ask a question now. In view of that story of Polycarp, who died so well for his Savior, would you be willing to die for your faith in Jesus. If called upon. We're very blessed in America. We don't have that kind of. Environment that we live in. At least not yet. But if you were in his place. Would you be willing to die. For your savior. If your answer is yes. And it's easy to say yes. In our circumstances. Oh sure I, I hope I'd be willing to. If you'd be willing 
to die for Jesus, for your faith in him, would you not also be willing to live fully for him as well? My fear is that sometime we're vacillating somewhere in between. We're, we're fearing death, but we're not all in for our Savior either. We're somewhere in the middle. Jesus said in Matthew 16, I'm going to be throwing out a few different Bible verses. You can either listen or if you, you're the type to like to follow along, or if you want to write them down and go look at them later, it's up to you. Matthew 16, starting in verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples there in Matthew 16, he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good is it for a man or a woman if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Are you living for Jesus? Are you looking forward to that reward? I think many people are afraid to die. And sometimes in being afraid to die, we don't truly live. In uh, John 12, you don't need to turn there, that's the account of Lazarus. Remember Lazarus? He wasn't a martyr, but he died of some sickness. And uh, some of the friends of him, uh, of, of Lazarus, they thought Jesus was too late. Oh, Jesus, if you would have come sooner, you could have saved him. You, you know what happened next, right? Lazarus, come forth. And out came a dead man, no longer dead, still wearing his grave clothes. Walked out of the tomb. Jesus rose him from the dead. He did it to make a point. But Lazarus still wore his grave clothes. And a lot of us are alive, but we're wearing grave clothes. Think about that. By the way, it's interesting that... Um, Later on in the account, it, it says that some of the people, the chief priests and others who were trying to get Jesus and kill him, they were mad at Lazarus, uh, Lazarus as well, and they were trying to kill him. There were plans to kill Lazarus. Why? They, they didn't want that walking testimony, that reminder of what Jesus can do. If we get rid of him, they won't, they'll forget about Lazarus. Think about that. Do you think Lazarus was afraid to die the second time? Are you kidding me? Can you imagine what he saw when he died the first time? What he got a glimpse of? He's probably mad. Why'd you bring me back? I have to get sick all over again. Now they're trying to kill me. I don't think he cared. He probably said, go ahead, bring it on. Kind of like Polycarp. It said that on account of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Are people putting their faith in Jesus because of your life and mine? There's a challenge for us. In Hebrews 11, it says that, talks about all of the prophets and those martyrs and those that suffered and died for their faith in Jesus. It says the world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy of them. Go ahead and turn to the book of Revelation, if you're following along in your Bible. We're going to probably finish up there in Revelation. A little foretaste of what's coming up with our Revelation series. I'm excited about it. I've put it off because it's a lot of work, but I've collected a lot of resources. And Here's my goal, and it's going to be audience participation, by the way, as you're turning to Revelation chapter 6. When we do this Revelation series, I'm going to be giving you 
uh, reading assignments and things to read ahead of time and to think about to help prepare you to get more out of it. Because if you just want me to give you a bunch of facts about Revelation, you can go read a book or watch video series. We don't need to waste our time. But I want you to get something out of it, and I want you to help me by asking questions. And um, Terry might help me understand some of it, because she studied it quite a bit. Together, we might get more out of it. And I want to apply it to our lives. I want to make sure it's applicational. So we're not just going to go through and do a deep study of Revelation alone. We're going to be extracting things out of it that mean something to us today in 2018. Okay? What was happening in Revelation 6, starting in verse 9? This was the opening of the fifth seal. The fifth seal was opened, and John, who's writing this because he's caught up in a vision, some think he was actually transported into the future in time and seeing the real thing. Doesn't really matter. Regardless, he saw what God wanted him to see. He saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. And those, those martyrs called out in a loud voice, How long, how long, sovereign God, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? They were each given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. In other words, there's a quota. Somehow God has a quota of those who are, he foresees and knows are going to die for him for a purpose, not wasted, but they get a special reward. I wonder what that reward is going to be. You're going to meet them in heaven and find out, by the way. You know that, right? You get to talk to them, including Polycarp. You stop and think how real heaven is, that you're going to have a conversation with Polycarp, not to mention all the others someday. Ask them questions. And get to know them. That's, that's your eternity, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Well... Um, Turn back to Revelation 2. There are seven letters that Jesus writes to the churches. And these are all symbolic. I believe they all have meaning for us today. And we'll get more into that when we get into this uh, in a few weeks. But um, the first of the seven letters is the church uh, written to the church in Ephesus. By the way, who was the uh, leader of the church in Ephesus? It was John. John, the apostle. Yeah, the disciple John. At first, anyways. The second letter is which one? Church in Smyrna. Yeah. The one we're talking about. Well, who was uh, in charge at the, when this was written? Polycarp. Lo and behold. See the connection there? Uh, it's also interesting to note this, that in those seven letters, if you map it out, Jesus would give compliments and then he'd give criticism. Some were very harsh calls them complaint. I have this complaint about you. Except for two churches. Which were the two churches that Jesus had nothing bad to say to them? First one was Smyrna. Does that say something maybe about the leadership of Polycarp? First church that Jesus didn't have a complaint against them? You're doing great. Keep the, up the good work. In fact, let's read it. Um, verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write this, He's dictating. John's taking notes, He's writing down word for word. To the church in Smyrna, write this, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation. This is Jesus himself talking. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. What, what does that mean? Um, I think what it means here is that they are physically impoverished because of the suffering, because of the persecution, because of the environment they live in with the um, Roman leader uh, Nero. Sorry about that. That keeps falling down, but as long as that's working. 
they're, they're, they're being severely persecuted, so they're probably losing belongings. And they're, so they're suffering physically, and so they don't have a lot of possessions. But he says, but you are rich. In other words, they're spiritually rich. They're rich where it counts. They're rich toward God. Talk about a compliment. Are you rich toward God? Regardless of what's in your bank account? That should be your life goal. I know your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Does Jesus mix words? (laughs) Not really. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Uh, Two quick things. The crown... Be faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. That word is uh, Stephanos or Stephanos. It has to do with the wreath that that Olympic champions would get when they won their event. And uh, so I don't think it's talking about salvation. It's not like your salvation's on the line. Your salvation is not on the line based on your good works. That's guaranteed. That's, That's sealed, signed, and delivered from Jesus through the Holy Spirit if you're in Christ. Now, what you do with your life, that determines your reward, your crown. And so I believe it's talking about that. And then there at the end, Jesus ends up with, uh, at the end of the letter, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. What's the second death? Um, There's a saying that if you, um, uh, that, what is it, Um, one, born, if you're only born once, you die twice physically die, but then you have spiritual death as well, which is the most tragic one. But if you are born twice, meaning you're born again, you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you only die once. Because we all die physically, but when you're in Christ, when we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, by faith, believing in Him, sealed in Him, the second death has no effect upon us. We're immune. We've got the antidote. It becomes a doorway. Will not be hurt by the second death. That's good news right there. Well, we won't go into more of that. There's um, more you could read on. Um, uh, I guess I do want to make this one comment and just refer back to last week. If you were here last week, you remember that I made the comment of the uh, false teaching and the heresy that was going on at the time when John was writing his letter. We looked at the book of 1 John, and he's talking about uh, false teachers. And one of the main false teaching at the time was Gnosticism, and that is this belief that the flesh is always inherently evil and corrupt, and it doesn't matter what you do with it. You can go commit sexual immorality and party it up. It doesn't matter because only the spirit part of the world made any difference. And the f- flesh part was all going to burn anyways. So do what you want with it. It makes no difference. That's the Gnostic view. That is not a Christian view. It does matter what we do with our bodies. We're called to holiness. Hmm. And there was uh, other uh, heresies going on. He refers to the Nicolaitans. And... Um, they, the Nicolaitans, as far as we know, there's a lot of these overlap, but the Nicolaitans most likely were promoting sexual immorality and the worship of idols. And so this was pervasive, all of these, and the Gnosticism as well, in the time of Polycarp. And there are written accounts of Polycarp that he debated and spent time with a lot of these people who were under the influence of false teaching and won them over to Christ so that they would repent and turn away from the false teaching and come and follow Jesus. That God was using him to to do that. And that's what we need to be doing today. We need to be informed. What are are some of the, uh, and I forgot to bring, I was going to print off a sheet of some of the main false teachings in the church today. 2018, America. What are some of the, 
What are some of the heresies or false teachings that are creeping in subtly? Well, to one, the biggest one is probably uh, universalism. It's not the same as the universalist church. Maybe related, but it's not meaning the universalist church. But universalism is this idea that, um, um, hey, everybody's included. Jesus died for everybody's sin, whether you accept him or not. And so you can do whatever you want. You can be a Muslim. You could be an atheist. You can, it doesn't matter. And I know a guy personally who's been here before that told me to my face that he loves to go around and tell people whether they're atheist or, or in gay marriage or um, Muslim or Hindu or whatever and say, it's okay, you can be who you are. You're who God made you to be. Keep doing what you're doing and look forward to heaven. And so you can see false teachings like this. Um, the enemy loves it because it's sending a lot of people to hell because they don't know that they need to repent and follow Christ alone. And so uh, Polycarp's dealing with that at his time, and that's happening today only in different flavors. So be aware. Read stuff, pay attention, and know the truth. The more you know the truth, the more then you might be able to help somebody get rescued out of the lies. In Matthew 10... It says, um, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me, Jesus is talking. Jesus said, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses it for my sake will find it. You want to really live? Surrender it to Jesus. Completely. Completely. In Matthew 24, if you want to just jot it down, Matthew 24, it's 9 to 14, I'm reading. Matthew 24, 9 through 14. It says, They will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, and then many will fall away. Don't let it be you. Not here, not on my watch, not at Mary and Grace. We don't want to fall away. We want to get closer that's my prayer. We get, we're getting closer to Jesus. We're, we're going to know him better. We're going to worship him more. We're going to get more radical for our faith. We're going to be more committed to what we believe. But many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Get hotter. Don't get colder, please. I'm going to help you. And if you're not willing or not wanting to get closer to Jesus, you're probably going to be uncomfortable here. And some of you maybe need to be uncomfortable because you're lukewarm or cold and Jesus still loves you, but um, the truth is going to make you squirm. Don't run from it if it does. Please, come closer to the fire. It says then, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So again, would you be willing to die for your Savior? And if you are, will you not also live for him? And I tell people all the time, we don't know what's coming. We don't know how close these things are that we're going to study in Revelation. But get right with God. Be ready. If you haven't yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please don't put it off. You may not have it tomorrow. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. It may be too late. And sadly for many, it is too late. They put it off and they put it off. I'll deal with that stuff later. And then something happens. Wednesday, I was, um, as I normally do, I take the kids early to school for FCA the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And um, the routine is I go over to the Lichtenberger farm and I collect Doug's grandkids, except for the youngest, Will, pile them in my car, and then we go up the road, uh, 423, to get Jane's friend, Daisy, 
And then we go over to Pleasant. And I sit in the parking lot and pray for them and tell my kids, if, if, if they don't have a speaker, call me in. I'll come in last minute. I'll share Christ with those kids in the public school. I love doing that. Oh, I love that. And this day, um, I'm picking up the Lichtenberger kids, and, I'm, I can, and it's dark still, and I can see a whole row of flashing lights just north of Newman's Cardington in the 423, and I got that sick feeling. I knew it was bad. It was cruisers, it was emergency squads, it was fire engines. I could see taillights of cars lined up. I went up Maple Grove to Owens instead. And uh, I, was, I was feeling this kind of anger. I said to, I think it was Caleb in the front seat next to me. And I said, oh, it makes me mad. Somebody probably was on their phone, probably texting and driving, and it's probably just made one little dumb mistake, and now somebody could be dead. Were they ready? I prayed, as I often do. And I looked at the news later in the day. Some of you know. A kid named Jesse Williams, or Jesse Williamson, I forget which, from Kansas, 26 years old, member of a rock and roll band. Living in Marion currently. But um, part of a rock and roll band, and I was curious, and I plugged his name into Facebook, and there it was. Same picture, same name, same description. It was him. Everything on his page was the F word. It was about getting drunk and meeting girls. That was his life. Get drunk and party. Play rock and roll music. Now, I'm not against rock and roll in and of itself. But was that young man, Jesse, ready to meet Jesus? No, I don't know. He could have made a last-minute decision. Someone could have shared the gospel with him the night before, before he had a chance to update his Facebook page. Only God knows. But know this, God is a fair judge. He doesn't grade on a curve, but he's a fair judge. So are you ready? If you're here and you haven't chosen Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please do it now. I beg you. And it's simple. Simple to get saved. The Bible says just believe in your heart that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that he died on the cross for your sins, and that you need forgiveness of your sins, and that you can't do it yourself. You can't save yourself no matter how good you are. That you need a Savior. And Jesus is the only way. He said... He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes as the Father except through me. So there you have it. Either God's lying and Polycarp wasted his life or it's all real and you need to do something about it. So choose Jesus now. If you do that today, just tell someone. Make sure you tell us and we'll help you grow. Um, would you stand with me as I pray? I'm gonna, this, is, this is spontaneous. Um, I didn't really plan this, but as I pray, I'm just going to invite, if anybody wants to step forward, um, just, to, just to say, I want to be all out for Jesus. I'd be willing to die for him if he called me, upon me to do that, but I want to live for Jesus. But also, each of you know somebody like Jesse, maybe that doesn't know Jesus, that's not ready to die. They're not ready. And by faith, I want this to be the year that we see God answer prayer and see people get right with God, people to get saved, to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, people who have been holding out. You know friends, family members, loved ones, neighbors, co-workers. If you just want to bring that forward and just say, Lord, use me. Use me to reach out to this person. I invite you to come forward as I pray. Let's just do that now. God in heaven, I want to thank you you're all welcome to step forward as I pray. And just, you're, you're bringing your burden to, the, to, the, to, the, to the Jesus. Bring in that person or, and yourself as well. By faith, I want to live for you. Jesus, we do want to live for you. But it's hard. We confess, Lord, that we struggle. That we're weak. That we are afraid. We're not bold enough. We don't feel like we can do it. In our human effort, Lord, we can't. We can't fully live for you. 
we're naturally, Lord, afraid of dying. But Lord, we want to be bold witnesses. We want to live so radically for you. We want to be filled with your spirit. We want to have the boldness and the strength and the power that Polycarp had. And, and say, go ahead, bring it on, whatever. I'm ready. No fear. Lord, we know that's a supernatural thing. We're weak. So I pray for those standing up front. Take our burdens. Take us, first of all. And like that Keith Green song, before we can go take it out to others, help us to live it ourselves. God, I want to live it more fully. I pray for each one here, each one in this room, each one that's come forward, that we would live it out more fully, more deliberately, more intentionally that we would seek your face, that we would read your word, that we would offer ourselves to you in prayer. God, that we'd spend time getting to know you so that you could fill us with your power and with your Holy Spirit and then use us as your vessels, albeit broken and chipped with rough edges, but to then to use us to take this gospel message, this good news of Jesus Christ to a dying world. Lord, I don't know if Jesse repented at the last minute. I pray for his family, friends, and loved ones that are remaining, that many of them would turn to Christ and his girlfriend who lives right here in Marion, in fact, at the Kensington place where some are going to be today. Maybe she'll be there. Maybe somebody who's in this room will share Jesus with that young girl that serves at Kensington, even today. I pray that she would come to know Christ as her Lord and Savior. So Lord, we give you ourselves, and we give you our loved ones that don't know Jesus yet. I thank you, Lord, for the testimony of Polycarp. I thank you for your word. I thank you for a risen Savior. God, we give you praise and thanks. Take us now and use us for your glory, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.